Hello, everybody. Good morning to those in Australia. Good afternoon and good evening. Welcome to our second anniversary. I'm Elizabeth Elfenbein, the founder and CEO of Under the Sisterhood, and I couldn't be more delighted to be celebrating two years with this amazing community that we've built together. So thank you so much for joining us. We have a jam-packed agenda. We're going to be we're going to be first sharing our our two years of accomplishments, and I'll do my best to go through that very quickly. And then we're going to get into our Sister of the Year programming and honoring uh, three amazing sisters of the year, actually honoring all the sisters of the year. Um, but we're going to start with, uh, we're going to start with our, our two years of achievements. And I think the thing that I want to mention is we're a social impact company that has really been about building a space where women are seen, heard, acknowledged, and celebrated. And we launched on Women's Equality Day, which is today, two years ago, with the intention for women to feel incredibly seen. As we built out our mission and we continue to live by it every day, we are building a global community where women's health and well-being are strengthened through sisterhood. And we've been doing that, we've been living that, um, and it's been a wonderful mission and really an honor to go on this journey with, with all of you. So here we are, it's the second anniversary for, for Under the Sisterhood, and I'm really excited. We created an anthem video that really depicts all of the amazing things we've accomplished. So I'm going to hit this. It's really quick. I think you'll enjoy it. We've been really busy. As you can see, we've been really busy. Um, we're so excited. We've had tremendous growth. Um, but at the cornerstone of what we do is we're a story sharing platform. We've dropped 130 podcasts, three seasons of podcasts representing women from over 50 countries. We've had 23 under the hood vlogs where we share women's superpowers, how they use their superpowers to support other women. And we've hosted 17 under the hood events. And I'm gonna get into some quick details. So season one, being a woman in today's world, we dropped that on our launch date. We dropped 12 actually, women representing eight countries. We dropped 39 before Women's History Month representing 19 different countries. As we got into season two, our, lead, our one of our creative leaders had the idea of Women's March of Voices. I insisted on doing a story a day because it was really important to me that we share with the community and celebrate 31 women in 31 days. And of these 31 women, uh, tw they represented 22 countries. So during Women's March of Voices was during Women's History Month, which was really exciting. And of course, we all know that International Women's Day is on March 8th. And so we were we had a, a really interesting story about a young woman who reached out to us via Instagram. Um, her name is Mohira Iktvar from Pakistan, and she was very interested in becoming part of Under the Sisterhood. So we interviewed um, Mohira, and then we asked her, she said, I would like to join the team. And I said, so, well, you could join our advisory board. 
um, what can you what what can you do? Like, what can you contribute? And she says, I can contribute community. So we built our first sister circle in Pakistan. We started with a number of sister circles, and that led us to recognize the need and the success of this programming. So we built a 12 week um, sisterhood journey. We take women on this wellness journey. And we proceeded to launch Sister Good and share this and complete this programming with the women in Pakistan. The women, um, we did a, a special um, edition for the women in partnership with Red Cross in Jamaica and Costa Rica on International Women's Day. We completed a 12 week program plus a reunion in, for women in Ghana. And um, most recently, we finished a 12-week program for the women in Liberia. This is the group, and um, the pastor of the church brought the women together, and we'll be doing a reunion next weekend. And with Sister Good, we're building sister leaders and sisterhoods in developing nations. And so it's been a wonderful thing. I can't thank uh, enough the sponsors, um, a few companies, and a lot of individuals who put their money in to help support making this happen. As we move along, um, during our first anniversary, we had the idea that we wanted to celebrate a Sister of the Year, and I couldn't be more honored to have her here today. Uh, Dr. Joanne Berger-Sweeney, she is the president of Trinity College in Hartford, Connecticut. She's the first woman and the first African-American president of Trinity, but she's also a neuroscientist, and she's done so much for women in science So with STEM. So just amazing work. So happy to have you here today. Joanne. So as we go into season three, this really became something, you know, and I have to applaud Becky. Elizabeth, you're a health and wellness expert. You really need to focus on, on bringing your expertise forward. And I was really fortunate. Uh, again, our creative leader came up with the idea of women making the world healthier. She also did Women's March of Voices. And we've been in the throes of season three. So far, we've dropped 60 podcasts. And, you know, these are women ranging from, from all different walks of life in the health and wellness space, Ex subject matter experts um, that are just unbelievable. And I'll, I'll explain more in, in a minute or two as we get into more of the programming. And then we did a special edition series. So we had, again, we went through, we had women, um, we had women making history during 2023's um, Women's History Month. And so we were able to feature five incredible women in Didi Nwelly, Dr. Dale Atkins, Zarifa Ghaffari, Francilia Wilkins-Rahim, and Grace Adapina. And Grace was actually part of our Sister Good program. So it was really thrilling to be able to bring her in and have her share her story. We had another special edition series, and I have to thank um, Jessica, um, Federer, who was unbelievable. I interviewed her and she said, we should do a series that really speaks to all of the women investing in women's health. So thank you, Jess. We were able to speak with Carly Saper. We were able to speak with Linda Grube, Alice Zhang, and Jess Carr. Um, these are women leaders in venture capitalists focusing on women's health. And so that was just really thrilling. And as I said, we had 23 vlogs and these vlogs are, were sharing women's stories, their superpowers, and how they use these superpowers to support other women. And these are women representing 15 different countries out of the 23. So again, the theme here for Under the Sisterhood is, and I didn't say it early on, is we're an intergenerational company. We support and we're building a community of women, of all women, from all backgrounds, from all ages, from all cultures. And so we're really excited to, in everything we do, pull that through. As I mentioned, we've hosted 17 Under the Hood events, and here are just a plethora of the ones we focused on, from celebrating, you know, women, women in history, manifesting abundance, back to sisterhood, with back to back to um, back to school, really focusing on educators. We've had we've focused on connecting connecting women. We've focused on Under the Hood of Women's Health and really getting across the the lifespan and life stories of of women and their health shedding life on health equity. These are some examples, but we're really excited about our under the hood events every month. We focused on the sixth level of leadership, which, you know, we had the four authors on. Dr. Stacy Finers is in the audience. And so I think it's really important to note as well for everybody here, these events are free. We are investing and actually 
Um, the women themselves, the women that we've able, been able to interview, and I, I want to say thank you to all of you for supporting and for sharing your stories, but being able to bring you in and have these not only subject matter experts, but share their stories, share their expertise, and, and network and connect with other women has been and, and allies has been really, really powerful. And we'll continue to do those. Um, September's is going to be an exciting one under the hood of body image. We will focus on um, a young woman, Dr. Andrea Braden's daughter, um, Annalise Joyner. We'll have, we'll have Dr. Um, Melissa Holmes. She's a pediatric and adolescent. Um, gynecologist, and we'll have a psychologist, Dr. Kara Reeves. So we will be getting under the hood of all kinds of subjects. And as I said, they're free. So it's a great educational opportunity, as well as an opportunity to meet amazing women. So up comes uh, Women's Health Month. And, you know, as I said, we interviewed and dropped 60 podcasts, Women Making the World Healthier. But of those 60 women, 75% uh, of those women focus on women's health. And one of the insights that came out was that women focus on very discrete areas in women's health, different life stages. They might focus on, on contraception. They might focus on perimenopause or menopause or postmenopause. They might focus on fertility or maternal health. So we found that there was an opportunity here to look at... To, get under the hood of women's health across the board and really explore everything from getting under the hood of puberty to adolescence, to reproductive health, to perimenopause, to menopause and postmenopause, and all of the subjects within. So for instance, in under the hood of puberty, we have under the hood of puberty, of period pain, adolescence, we'll get into sexual health, we'll get into um, contraceptions. We, we have many different subjects within. We'll also get into conditions like, for instance, during the reproductive years, things like fibroids or endometriosis. We'll deal with egg freezing. We'll deal with breastfeeding and pregnancy and fibroids. Um, and then as we move on, autoimmune disease and um, perimenopause, menopause, and postmenopause, we'll get into bone health, brain health. We'll get into um, to cardio health. So we'll be getting into every, every different subject. And I think the amazing thing here is that we're bringing together not only young women and women as they age and go through every life stage, we're also bringing in experts who support that. And what we found is the combination of the two really inspires action. It really helps what we want to do and what we heard. And I'm looking at several doctors on, on, on here from Dr. Gofrani, Dr. Holmes, Dr. Braden, uh, Dr. Creatura, Dr. Miller, um, Dr. Um, Bernie Russell. One of the things we heard from all of them is I have five to eight minutes to see my patients. And in some of them with the private practices where they have cash businesses, they, they can spend more time. But what they said is I don't really have time to educate my patients. So we wanted to create a story sharing platform and resources from puberty to postmenopause to support women, to help educate them at every single life stage. Again, we're an intergenerational company and we recognize that if we support them at every stage, so we know that mothers and organizations have young daughters. We know that there's grandmothers who could be supporting women at every life stage, but within the family dynamics. So we really wanna educate and inspire action and really drive women to take better care of their health. And one of the things we know um, with all of my prior experience with caregivers is that eight out of 10 women are caregivers and they are so busy caring for everybody else that often they put themselves last. So here's an opportunity. We created the platform. The stories will continue to come. And we are just so amazingly grateful for all of the, the incredible women who, who have um, shared their stories. In the process of doing this, we had our we had our launch event during Under the Hood of Women's Health during Women's Health Month, and we brought in these four amazing panelists: Dr. Melissa Holmes, who is a pediatric and adolescent gynecologist; Dr. Andrea Braden, who is a an OBGYN. She delivers baby, but she's all babies, but she's also a breastfeeding medicine expert and a lactation consultant. Dr. Gofrani, who delivers baby, she's an OBGYN. She's a thought leader across OBGYN health. And Dr. Taniqua Miller, who is a, an OBGYN by training um, and a NAM certified um, menopause expert. And so she has now decided to focus this stage of her life on, mid, on midlife health in her practice. The thing that's unique about all of them in this expert council as well is that they're all entrepreneurs. They all have companies on top of it. So they have their businesses, they are being clinicians at the same time they have their practices. 
So we are really, really thrilled to have established this expert council. And we're almost, we're almost through this and getting on with um, our Sisters of the Year um, um, portion of the program. But I would be remiss if I didn't thank our incredible team. We have an amazing team at Under the Sister. And I'm looking at Amy, Matt, Sharon, Vanessa, Mark, John, and then our board of advisor, uh, advisors from Becky, Taniqua, Elsie, Dr. Katayoun, um, I can't see all of them. Um, Rachel, Dr. BCW, Dr. Rachel Bullingham, Lucia, Wei Tang, Rick, and Dr. Erica Bowen. We have an amazing board of advisors who have been incredibly supportive and really de helping determine how we move forward and how we grow our organization. And lastly, I want to say thank you to every single woman who has shared her story, who has given her heart, who has given her time. On, on the panel or time in the sister circles. We've done several sister circles and really committed to helping um, be part of Under the Sisterhood. And thank you to the partners and the alliances we're, we're, we've made and the partnerships we're in the process of forming. We're very excited to be really, um, to, to, to be connecting and building sisterhood and community at a larger scale. And so now I'm, we're gonna, we're gonna move into the Sisters of the Year part of the program. And this is gonna be where we spend more time. It's, this is really about you, all of the incredible Sisters of the Year. I wanna say this has been a very interesting journey, um, this one. It wasn't easy to have our first one, but when you're focusing on just one Sister of the Year, it's a lot easier. We had our creative leaders said, you know what, we should do more than one sister of the year because we've been focusing on all these areas from sustainability to women's health to women's rights. We really want to ensure that we that we celebrate all the different ways and capacities of women and what they're doing. And so we created the Sisters of the Year um, Awards. We went out, we, we put out nominations, we put it in our newsletter, we, set, we put out several posts, we got hundreds of nominations back in all of the categories. And it was really hard to sort them out and come down with three in every category. So I wanna say this has been a, what's really amazing is that it's been a, a democratic um, experience. You have voted, women and men have voted for the people who are on the stage tonight. And what I forgot to mention is that we are going to go through the actual awards and then we will shift into the panel mode where we will go into a live conversation just because it's a little more expedient and easier to get in and out. So for, for so I'm going to move on. We're going to get into Sister of the Year and Women's Health. And as I said, I think what's been in, incredible about this was that we had hundreds of nominations. From the nominations, we were able to call down to three, three in each category, which was not easy. And then we put out a vote. And you guys voted for the women who are here today and who will, who will receive the award. So thank you for that. Thank you for the participation. For the Sister of the Year in Women's Health, this award will be presented in recognition of outstanding contributions to the field of women's health through unwavering commitment to advancing medical knowledge, empowering women with the tools and information they need and advocating for better healthcare practices. We have three incredible, incredible nominees. Carolee Lee, the founder and CEO of WAM, Women's Health Access Matters, a not-for-profit accelerating research and innovation in women's health through the focus on the economic value of investment. Next up is Dr. Beth Garner, a gynecologic oncologist, scientist, and executive leader, her unwavering commitment to advancement, advancing women's health and her leadership in clinical research have significantly improved the lives of countless women. Okay, I guess I'll be the only one copying, but that's okay. And lastly, Dr. Iris or Karen Orbach, a renowned gynecologic surgeon, the author of the best-selling Beating Endo, How to Reclaim Your Life from, from Endometriosis and a Prominent Subject Matter Expert. And the winner is Dr. Iris Karen Orbach. Congratulations. And I'm gonna read her, I'm gonna read her bio, her intro. Dr. Iris Karen Orbach is a renowned gynecologic surgeon, the author of the best-selling Beating Endo, How to Reclaim Your Life from Endometriosis, and prominent subject matter expert in Below the Belt, a powerful film 
executively produced by Hillary Rodham Clinton. Dr. Iris is a fellowship trained endometriosis excision surgeon who sees the value in addressing endometriosis as an inflammatory disease with the cornerstone of endometriosis treatment being the surgical incision of endometriosis. She understands the importance of combining and integrating, incorporating integrative medicine and combining Eastern and Western medicine approaches in helping patients heal and getting them on the road to recovery. Dr. Iris sits on several boards and she's been featured in by Cosmopolitan, Vogue, Allure, The Today Show, NBC, CA Live, Wall Street Journal, CNN, US News, National Geographic, Marie Claire, The Washington Post, NPR, Stylecaster, People, The Ethos, Romper, Health Central, as well as many more publications and broadcast networks. Congratulations, Dr. Iris. Thank you. We will we will move in in a, in a few minutes into the next phase. So the next category, the Sister of the Year in, in Women's Rights. What? Sorry about this. This award will be presented to an exceptional champion of women's rights. In a world where the fight for equality continues, this woman has stood as a beacon of hope and change, tire tirelessly advocating for the rights and freedoms of women everywhere. Her courage, resilience, and relentless pursuit of justice have empowered women to raise their voices and claim the rightful place in society. First one we all know is Billie Jean King, a former world number one tennis player. She has been a huge advocate for gender equality and has long been a pioneer of equality and social justice. She fought the fight from the very beginning for women in sport. Next is Zarifa Ghaffari, a human rights activist, the author of Zarifa, A Woman's Battle in a Man's World, a poignant memoir and the inspiration for her Netflix documentary, In Her Hands, and is the former mayor of Maiden Shahir in Afghanistan. Lastly, Rana Burke is an American activist and business executive who founded the Me Too movement in 2006 which sought to assist survivors, survivors of sexual violence, especially women of color. And our sister of the year for women's rights is Zarifa Ghaffari, a women's advocate, human rights activist, the author of Zarifa, A Woman's Battle in a Man's World, a poignant memoir and the inspiration for her Netflix documentary in her hands and the former mayor of Maiden Shahir in Afghanistan. Zarifa was one of the few Afghan female mayors and was also the youngest to be appointed at the age of 24. She is known for her efforts to advance women's rights in Afghanistan. And Zarifa was chosen as an International Woman of Courage in 2020 by the US Secretary of State and received the 2022 International Women's Rights Award at the United Nations Geneva Summit. She was included by the BBC in the list of 100 inspiring and influential women from around the world. And she was included in the Badass 50 list. She also received the award Women Who Can Change the World by InStyle. Congratulations, Zarifa. So the next category, which we all love, we love them all and they all have very different, diff different meanings, but um, in sustainability, we're really excited to present this award to a woman who has achieved remarkable contributions in sustainability through her visionary leadership and unwavering commitment to creating a more sustainable world. She has pioneered initiatives that not only protect our planet, but also uplift communities. Her work in promoting sustainable practices has set a new standard, ensuring that the future generations inherit a healthier, more equitable world. So our three nominees 
Arkachikorn Borakam, which I hope I did okay. Um, she's a, a Thai landscape architect and chief executive officer of Porous City Network, a social enterprise that looks to increase urban resilience in Southeast Asia. She campaigns for more green space in cities. Congratulations, Kachi Korn. And Didi Unweli, a Nigerian entrepreneur, an expert on African agriculture and nutrition, philanthropy and social innovation, and the president and CEO of the One Campaign. And lastly, Kim McDonald, a visionary leader and innovative entrepreneur who founded Thankful, an organization that combines philanthropy and business to drive positive, sustainable, and scalable impact. And the winner is Ndidi Unweli. As I said, Ndidi is an expert in food ecosystems, entrepreneurship, social innovation, and philanthropy. She has over 25 years of international development experience and is the founder of Leap Africa and African Food Changemakers. She is also the co-founder of Shahil Consulting, Agriculture and Nutrition, and Ace Foods Processing and Distribution. And Diddy is the president and the CEO of One Campaign and serves on the boards of the Rockefeller Foundation, Agra, Koji Consumer Products, LTD, India, Stambic, IBTC Group, the Young Global Leaders of the World Economic Forum, and the Bridgespan Group. And Diddy is a TED speaker, was recognized as a Schwab Fellow, and a young global leader by the World Economic Forum and has received numerous awards and recognitions, including a national honor by the Nigerian government and the Harvard Business School Distinguished Alumni Award. She is the author of Social Innovation in Africa, a practical guide for scaling impact and food entrepreneurs in Africa, scaling resilient agriculture businesses, both published by Rutledge and Walking for God in the Marketplace. Congratulations in Diddy. Congratulations to all of our sisters of the year. I know this is a little different in that we're not having you speak at the same, you know, for, for each award, but we wanted to make sure that we could get through and be able to share a panel and really speak with our thought leaders. And so today we're hosting a panel, our sister of the year and Amy Danielson Paul, our head of programming will be hosting the conversation and I will hand it over to her. Yeah, hi everyone. Uh, once again, I'm Amy Danielson-Paul, Head of Programming here at Under the Sisterhood. I've been with Elizabeth for the past two years. We actually were connected um, through a mutual friend and from the very first event that we had two years ago, uh, we've been working and building out our Under the Sisterhood community and programming ever since. So it's such an honor to be here. I'm really excited. And I just have to commend Elizabeth for her uh, amazing work for the past two years, her diligence, her vision, her fortitude to keep going and to keep uh, expanding into her vision as well as that awesome video that we got to see at the beginning. It was so good. I had goosebumps uh, watching that, seeing all the women that have come through our community who have contributed their stories, that have contributed uh, to the community in so many ways and who are helping shine light on areas of women's health that are so important and so instrumental in helping women as we, um, as we, we, want a healthier world, can we can make a healthier world, a world more sustainable world and uh, with equal rights. So um, now I'd like to uh, move on over to Iris. Iris, congratulations. It's so good to meet you here today. Thanks for having me. First of all, to Elizabeth, I mean, so impressive what you've put together in just two years on such a global scale. It really is. It really is incredible. And the video highlighted that so well. We have to, I mean, it just was a, such a such a treat to see all of that. Um, so Iris, I would love to chat with you today and just hear a little bit more about your story and um, your journey into all the work that you've been doing and how you've been contributing to the enhancement of women's health. So um, I'll start with what inspired you to focus on women's health. It's a great place to start. Yeah. <laughs> and and how has your, your journey evolved over time? Yeah, so um, as when I was chatting with Elizabeth earlier this week, my impetus for becoming a physician was 
when my dad would take me on rounds in the hospital when I was a little kid and just watching his connection with his patients um, and his patients loved him. Everyone in the hospital loved him from the janitors to the security people when we walked in and obviously especially to the patients who he helped. Um, but from a women's standpoint, when I was a resident, well, when I was in medical school, I just fell in love with obstetrics and gynecology. And then when I delved into the field and I walked into an operating room that was doing endometriosis surgery, I said, this is exactly where I wanted to be. And I didn't know in what capacity, I didn't know where I was going to go with it. I just knew it was so in alignment with everything about me. Um, um, and essentially, I was really lucky to be mentored by, I think, two of the best surgeons in the field of endometriosis, who both of whom were at the end of their, towards the end of their career, Dr. Harry Rich and Dr. C.Y. Liu. And they were so passionate about their careers and helping those with endometriosis. And I loved what I was doing. And I think they saw that in me and they shared so much of their passion with me. And then for me, I was trained as an endometriosis excision surgeon. So that's minimally invasive surgery. I do robotic surgery. But to me, it was a puzzle. Why are there so many who are suffering? It's like 200, and, 200 million women worldwide who are suffering from this disease that can really rob women of their lives. Literally, you know, it can affect you from in a gynecological way from painful periods, painful sex, period pain, pain all month long to gynecological or, sorry, to GI symptoms such as constipation, diarrhea, bloating, urological symptoms like urinary urgency frequency, and then fertility issues, fatigue, exhaustion. I mean, you can just imagine like people's lives are really taken away from them. And something that people weren't really looking at was a head to toe approach because I started to look at endo from an inflammatory approach. And what were these implants of endo that were inflammatory doing from a mind body perspective? And Although I was trained as a surgeon, I started to incorporate all these multidisciplinary approaches to heal um, patients. And it was sort of like this, it's been like a, almost two decades of trying to solve this puzzle that when I started was purely a surgical um, treatment. And, and don't get me wrong, the gold standard for, for surgical or for treatment for endometriosis is surgical excision of endo. But when you have a disease that takes almost a decade to be diagnosed. And I mean, and patients often see on the average of eight to 10 physicians over a course of that decade, patients would be lucky to be only suffering for 10 years, but most are suffering for 20 years and 30 years. And when you have this inflammatory disease, so many other systems are put in motion that cause such pain. So I tried to unravel this whole disease cascade and started approaching it from the gut, from the mind body, from the pelvic floor, um, and from an autoimmune way. And it really has allowed patients to reclaim their lives. And for me, it's seeing these women whose lives were like literally robbed from them. And when they, like I had a patient earlier today and she had just gotten engaged and she's a singer and she started singing again and going on tour. And when I'm watching people do what they love again, when they had to stop doing it for such a long time, it's like such a gift to witness that. So, um, and I'm doing it not only on a one, just a patient doctor at a time, trying to do it more on a global level and was really involved in the movie with Shannon Cohn, the first movie, um, and a what, and then the second movie, which came out a couple of years ago, Below the Belt, that, which has gone internationally because we're trying to figure out how do we raise awareness? How do we shorten this 10 year diagnostic delay? And that's really what I've been working on for the last 15 years. And um, the fruits of our efforts have really been seen. And it is just amazing because endometriosis is like a household world, word. People may not know what it means, but at least they've heard it. And, and women aren't afraid to say, oh, I have endometriosis. Whereas five years ago, people were embarrassed to say the word or they had never heard the word. So in order to raise awareness, we really it wasn't working navigating through the physicians. And so we really had to go towards patients to change the trajectory. And 
um, also do it through storytelling, through changing the hearts and minds in order to raise awareness. So it has been such a fun, I wouldn't call it a project, but a passion. How do we help people and allow for earlier diagnosis, less suffering, and allowing those to really live the lives that they should be living. So it's, it's been it's been a lot of fun, a lot of hard work, but a lot of fun. Yeah, that's incredible. Um, that's incredible. What um, can you share um, a significant challenge that you faced in advocating for this? I mean, already I can hear a bit of what that would be, and just in terms of the <laughs> the yeah. awareness and the education that has to happen. But um, you know, how have you been overcoming this as you've as you've been changing the hearts and minds through uh, story sharing and storytelling, I'm sure that's been a, a big part of it, but I would love to hear more. Yeah. Initially, there was just a challenge of me being part of a surgical organization and me not only approaching endometriosis from excision of endometriosis. I mean, that's the mainstay of treatment, but a, approaching it in a multidisciplinary approach. So that was like me being a salmon swimming upstream, but I was up for the fight. And I think now it's people are really moving in that direction of multidisciplinary care along with excision of endo, which is the cornerstone. So um, that was a moving train that's already moving forward, thankfully. But uh, the hard part is that the education system is so outdated for endometriosis. I mean, I always tell everyone, I learned more in my first week of fellowship than I did in four years of OBGYN training plus four years of medical school. So in eight years, I learned less than I did in my first week of fellowship. And even today in 2024, residents are learning the same outdated information. I learned nearly, uh, I don't want to say how old I am, but a while ago. And um it's such a shame because they're even being taught the wrong surgery. They're being taught ablation of endometriosis, which is the complete wrong surgery to treat this disease when excision of endo has like prospective ram randomized. It has great data and we all know that it's, it's the right treatment. So um, it's frustrating that most gynecologists are armed with outdated information and same thing as in medical school. So we're working, um, Shannon and I, Shannon, the producer, um, who we've been working together for, I think, 15 or 18 years to try and solve so much. But we have like continuing um, education for nurses, we're doing school nurses training to pick up teens when they're having painful periods in high school, we're starting college education in colleges, um, medical school um, has been launched. So it's just, it's really trying to undo what's being taught at the end, which is, we used to rely on doctors for help, and I'm a physician as well, but unfortunately, the way that the healthcare industry is, you have seven minutes to help someone, and when someone has a chronic disease, seven minutes is, isn't even the tip of an iceberg, so we're trying to go back and do like a run around the, you know, the doc, not a run around the doctors, but start at the the beginning where the pain begins and educate all of them as well as leading up to training medical students residents and um, fellows and you know seasoned physicians so we're, we're literally going from here to there mm -hmm. so it's it's been a real uphill <laughs> battle to say the least yeah wow and takes time right and it, it really does take take time yeah uh, so uh, what, what what would be some of the areas of women's health that you feel need more attention and and maybe elaborate a little bit on why you why you feel that way yeah i mean there's so many areas of women's health i mean women are more likely to suffer from autoimmune diseases and as we know autoimmune diseases are on the rampage in this day and age and i think there has to be um more of it's not only research and money, but the research has to be clean money for um, for to help women, meaning not just what medicines can help band aid someone's symptoms. Where is it coming from? What's the ideology? Like, how do we stop it before it happens? Um, so I think that's where our money needs to go is understanding the diseases more, as well as all the way up to at least for my disease for my surgery, for endometriosis, there's so few surgeons who perform the surgery, yet there's 200 million who suffer from this disease. So we need everything from 
you know, we know endo is a genetic disease. So if the mom has it, like in the NICU when a baby's born, they should have the label endometriosis family history. So when the pediatrician is helping that young girl who's nine years of age and is having stomach ache and gut issues, there should be a flag in her chart that says, oh, endometriosis, that could very well be the cause. Or when she starts to have her menses, if she has period pain, it should be in the chart that says endometriosis. So it's like, there's simple things and there's very complex things, but in general, um, it, it, across the board, all diseases that afflict women need more attention. That's for sure. From awareness, financial, emotional trauma. Um, I'm big into the whole trauma piece because they go so long being told you look perfectly fine. There's nothing wrong with you when there certainly is. Mm -hmm. And I, I would imagine that this is what contributes to women being more prone to autoimmune diseases is the the, what you've already mentioned, the lack of education, but um, the trauma piece and the perhaps the stress, the emotional and mental aspects that go into a woman's health. But I would love to hear also what you've, you know, what else is there that make women more prone? If you could just share with our, our group. Yeah. So first of all, endometriosis, there's a genetic component. So it could come from mom's side or dad's side. Um, the afflicted child has a 70 to 100% likelihood of having endo. So there's a genetic component. We haven't isolated the gene yet, but there's certainly a genetic component. And or um, when the mom's pregnant with a fetus, exposure to certain chemicals, like we do know that dioxins, while the mom is pregnant with a fetus, can cause endometriosis in that fetus. And there's probably so many other chemicals that we just don't even know of. I don't know how many people are even doing that research. So the question is, those with endometriosis, some have symptoms that are so severe, some have symptoms that are you know minor and some can have tons of endo and be asymptomatic some can have a spot of endo and be extremely symptomatic the converse is true as well so i, I think the question is um why is that i mean certainly we know that trauma stresses can afflict anyone and everyone and make anyone's even if you stub your toe and you haven't slept for three days your pain of your toe when you stub it is going to be far worse than had you had a restful three nights sleep so the central nervous system is processing all the pain and lack of sleep or trauma will always intensify a disease but i want to be clear that endometriosis isn't caused by trauma, endometriosis isn't, isn't caused by stress. The next book that I want to write is about trauma, but more so about the medical trauma um, being told, the, the medical trauma that those who have endometriosis suffer in the nearly decade-long diagnostic delay because their doctor looks at them, they're like, you're perfectly fine. And imaging as well is tends to be normal in those with endometriosis. So that's another area I actually probably should have reflected upon to answer your last question. Why in 2024 can't we pick up endometriosis on an ultrasound or an MRI? Some people can. It's just the training is so, so it's there, but hospitals don't want to adopt that training. It's a fight I'm fighting also. Um, so there's, there's just like a pushback on anything that's different than people have learned. And I'm just like an outside the box human who, who fights, who, who kind of likes to fight these fights. Yeah. Um, so I guess now that this kind of takes us right into looking ahead and you've spoken a little bit on it, but you can elaborate a little bit more with us tonight. What are your hopes for the future for women's health? Oh, wow. I mean, I'm going to kind of pare it down and speak to my disease because it's a little easier for me to do that for my disease that affects so many, one in eight, probably one in 10, maybe. Um, I would say earlier diagnostic delay, not suffering or robbing someone's life for a decade. Um, and then I would dream and hope that at some point there would be endometriosis centers everywhere that approach this disease with expert surgeons who excise the endometriosis plus a multidisciplinary approach, mind, body, gut, gut healing. Um, and I would hope that in the same way diabetes has these centers all over 
in every city, right? Someone who's diabetic has then they go to the foot doctor, they go to the nutritionist, they go to the ophthalmologist. There's just like a triage of things that they go to to allow them to live their lives in their best way. I would hope that there'd be something implemented for endometriosis when it's as common as diabetes. So mm-hmm. you should get the funding, the same amount of funding as well. Yeah, very much so. Um and so you've, you've spoken about storytelling. We're a storytelling platform too. So we see that, you know, how much it really helps in uh, having women open up about what they're going through, but also to not feel so alone in the process of what they are going through and just opening up the conversation around these areas, even especially something like endometriosis. So how uh, share a little, a little bit more about your experience with the storytelling and the personal ex- experiences and how they've contributed to um, advancing women's health awareness with the projects you've been working on and in your mission. Sure. So the first film that I was involved in with Shannon, which you can see one of the posters behind me, the end of what film, which mm-hmm. came out in 2015. And that was just more so raising awareness. I mean, even today, you know, the media can't even get the definition of endometriosis correct, which is so incredibly frustrating because if we don't have the definition, we can't solve the problem. Um, so it was helping patients truly understand the basics about endometriosis because they certainly weren't learning it from their gynecologist. And then at the same time, and in parallel and in tandem, we were working on more of like that storytelling story below the belt which had amazing people behind it, like Hillary Clinton was executive producer, Rosario Dawson, um, Mae Whitman, Corinne Fox, and then like just so many people were behind this film. And we even screened it in Congress. We got bipartisan funding for Congress. It kind of was like the beginning of us to start get fu- getting funding for endometriosis. Um, and I really saw the difference and and end of what was like very low budget and below the belt was more so following for patients and tugging at the hearts and minds of the viewers who are witnessing and watching the film. And it was amazing if someone could walk in not knowing anything about endometriosis and they had such um, a, a felt sense for what those patients ha- were suffering with, like what what they were experiencing. And I think it also allowed their loved ones to then understand their disease a little bit better and to be there to support them. So um, I I think for me, it's been such a fun project. I mean, I can't wait. I have ideas for next ones as well. And I have so many plans of what I want to do to help uh, more people. But um, it's uh, it's just I, I feel like storytelling is really the way to raise awareness. Yeah, I agree. And I think you you um you made a good point about it helps the loved ones, the family, the friends understand more too and know how to be able to be a support and to understand it for themselves because mm-hmm. it can be very isolating and especially if mm-hmm. someone has as you said lost a decade of their lives to being able to do the the things and that are that they're passionate about um their their livelihood. You know, it can be very isolating process. So that support is so important. Um, mm-hmm. yeah. Um, I'm going to take a moment to look into the chat for a second. Um, and also if anyone has any questions that they'd like to, um, or anything that they would like to contribute, share a story here, if they've had experience with endo- endometriosis, um, anything that you might like to ask Dr. Iris, this would be a great time. You can drop it into the chat or you can raise your uh, Zoom hand. Um, let's see. If, okay, up here. Oh, going up. Sorry, I'm just scrolling. Okay. Yeah, Beth says this is true for many areas of women's health education for med students and trainees. I think that might have been referring to maybe the outdated education. <laughs> um, Dr. Stacy Finer says, Iris, if med students are being trained outdated information and we know it, isn't that a real liability to the schools for law students? That was kind of my question too. <laughs> in the back of my head um well we're you know it's 
lawsuit, I mean, I don't know the legality behind it, but um, unfortunately, big pharma is behind a lot of it. You know, these medicines aren't removing the inflammatory mediators, and they're the ones who are giving money to a lot of hospitals. And it's, I'm not anti-big pharma, don't get me wrong at all. There's certainly a role and a place for it. But the cornerstone of treatment for endo is a surgical excision of endo. Um, so we're doing our best. We're starting to do to raise um, awareness on in in medical schools, and that's through Shannon Cohn's Endo What Foundation. Mm-hmm. So it would be amazing to have other partners to help teach medical students. Yeah. Right. Right. Um, okay, I'm going to jump over to the hands that are raised here. Uh, is it Hannah or Hane? Hannah, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Iris, for this very rich insight. So I posed my question on the chat as well. You mentioned the need for cultural change when it comes to training medical doctors. I very much appreciate that. I come from a family of doctors and they all abide by Western medicine. I'm from Morocco, though, and I realized over time and in seeing the limitations of it that uh, Eastern knowledge and ancestral medicine can be extremely helpful. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on the points of junction and the cross-fertilization of both approaches when it comes to women's health specifically. Yeah, I love the question. So a lot of my book um, really speaks to like this cross between East versus West. Even though I'm an MD, I actually think I'm much more Eastern in my approach to medicine. And I, and adding the Eastern approach is honestly what has allowed my patients to get so much better. So the first thing that I do is I try and heal the gut. Um, whether it's working with integrative nutrition and like the, the gut is the brain of the body, you know, in the mind gut connection. And we also know that all autoimmune diseases come from the gut and endometriosis is autoimmune like, and those with endometriosis have a higher likelihood of autoimmune diseases. So that's why the first thing I try and do is to um, heal the gut in an integrative approach. I also try and heal the mind. I put get my patients on a meditation challenge and a mind body challenge, because if we know that 90 to 95% of serotonin comes from the gut, And just about every one of my patients has anxiety and or anxiety and depression and or anxiety, depression and trauma and or anxiety, depression, trauma and OCD. I mean, I could just go on and on because every one of my patients has it. Who wouldn't if you go to the doctor for 10 years and they tell you nothing's wrong with you because your ultrasound's normal. So just having this disease for so long without anyone recognizing it and then your gut's off, then your serotonin's off then it's like almost impossible to get yourself better. Um, So I definitely believe in all sorts of mind body from somatic work tends to be extremely beneficial for my patients um, because the, you know, like Bessel van der Kolk spoke about the body keeps the body keeps the score. So I work with somatic therapists. I work with all different types of therapists um, and it's extremely beneficial Um, I get my patients into pelvic floor physical therapy because their muscles are so tight, have them work with acupuncturists to down to decrease inflammation. Obviously we talk about proper nutrition. No doctors talk about nutrition in the seven minutes that they have. Um, it's so important with organic eating and clean eating. Um, and there is, I mean, I could go on and on, on East meets West and integrate. It's very integrative in the approach that I take, um, Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I saw another hand up. Lucia, I'm not sure where. Oh, no, it was me. I. It's funny you just mentioned pelvic floor physical therapy because when my doctor just sent me for that a few months ago, I thought I thought she was joking. I thought she was making a joke. I had never heard. I had never heard of that. Um, I was going to say this is not about endometriosis. This is about women's healthcare in general and missing diagnoses. Uh, and that I think that in addition to uh, things just being missed because they don't show up on a scan or some sort of image or a, a diagnostic test, that it can can be recognized. You can get that validation, but it gets put into another bucket. So especially menopause. So my very best friend who's my age was having trouble 
finding words and she was had like brain fog and and she's a polyglot you know and she just wasn't finding her words and she reported it and her doctor said well yes this is you know she validated it yes this is this is a very common you know brain fog is very common for menopause so stop the inquiry it's menopause turned out to be a, a stage for glioblastoma you know aggressive brain tumor unmethylated like she's not going to live um so the inquiry can stop if doctors think they've got oh well that's the explanation and i think that is particularly insidious that especially with something like menopause where there are so many symptoms so many things that can be attributed to it that and puberty so many things that can be attributed that it just gets like oh validate and then move on we're not going to look any further yeah i i'm so sorry that that happened to your friend that it's like it, it breaks my heart and i think that it's part and this is when i was in medical school is like people don't have a sense of humility like maybe get us, I'm not quite sure, maybe see this person, or I'm not quite sure, let's send you to a neurologist or let's send you somewhere. There's something about doctors always having to be right and being um, that I saw, I've seen all throughout my career. And then there also has to be, we can't not mention insurance companies, like the more money, and again, I'm not anti-insurance companies either, but the more money a, a physician spends on a patient when you're in network, the lower grade that doctor gets. So a doctor who will say, geez, let me send you for a brain MRI. Insurance isn't going to approve it, right? And it's going to take countless hours for their staff to approve it. And, and if that doctor spends a lot of money on a patient, the insurance company dings the doctor. And then patients think they have a low grade through the insurance company, but it's it's not because they're a bad doctor, but it's because they're spending money. So the system's just a mess. I mean, I could talk about that for about 15 hours. Um, well, Becky kind of has a uh, question here in the chat that's along those lines too. We hear so often that women accept misdiagnoses and the words that nothing is wrong. How do we get women to challenge these words when they are clearly suffering? What has worked in getting women to act and seek new care? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I really encourage my patients to know their knowing and to trust their intuition and to know when there's something wrong and keep searching until they can find that something uh, that makes sense. And that, I mean, I think that's the best. And I say that all the time to my patients is know your knowing and trust your knowing, trust your gut. And that's why the gut is the brain of the body. That statement didn't come up for no reason. That's what I was just about to say too. It's uh, interesting how that, <laughs> how that plays out. Yeah. Yeah. Um, any other questions here? Anybody like to share a story or? You know what, Amy, that what you just said, the gut is the brain of the body goes so, it pairs so nicely with you reversing from saying the mind body connection to the body mind connection. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or maybe you can to... explain to people what you mean by that. Sure. Yeah. Um, so my background came through dance and then it's, it's expanded into all different types of fitness modalities, movement modalities. And one thing that I've been grateful for and, and having that um, dance education at such a young level is that it has allowed for me to really get to know my body on, on such an instinct, instinctual level, you know, my gut instinct has always been really strong. And, and I've, I always remember Martha Graham's words is that every, you know, everything is inside the body and everything comes from the body. So these, it, I, I flipped the, the coined phrase, you know, the mind body connection that, you know, it's the mind driving the body, but actually it's the body mind connection. And that from the body is where we resource our, our wisdom, our knowledge, and those, those instincts that tell us, something else is wrong here. <laughs> Even though the one, the doctor or somebody is telling me, everything's okay. It's, it's learning how to follow that, the, the body in, in, in knowing if everything is okay or not. Um, yeah. So let's just have a, I, I guess it's Elizabeth. I, I didn't put my hand up. I can't see myself, so I'm sorry. I don't know what, how to do it, but, um, but I do want to talk a little bit, have you, um, Dr. Iris talk a little bit about this inflammation and auto-inflammatory diseases and, and I want to just give a 
maybe 60 second background because I spontaneously, and my doctor actually is on here, Dr. Chris Creatura. I was in for a, a routine gynecologic exam, I would say 12 years ago. I didn't know at the time I was going through perimenopause. And I got a call back from my blood work that my thyroid was off and that I might have hyperthyroidism. Anyway, I'd love for you. Um, and it was, of course, a journey. I got into doctors, I was very fortunate, but I'd love for you to talk a little bit about what you see beyond with the endometriosis because of the interlinking, if you will. And because I think with the women and the men here in this space, it's really good for them to understand whether it's their daughter, their wife, their sister, their colleague, you know, can you explain a little more deeply about that? Yeah, sure. So from the scope of, or the lens of endometriosis, endometriosis lesions, which those who are afflicted by, they're born with endometriosis. And it's within the lesion, it sets off these inflammatory mediators or cytokines, which sets, sets forth inflammation throughout the whole body. So there's a generalized fatigue. It goes to the gut, causes inflammation in the gut. Then that is what causes the like dysbiosis or the imbalance within the gut whether it's in the small intestine causing SIBO or in the large intestine causing large intestinal dysbiosis. And we know that autoimmune diseases come from the gut. So, um, and it's probably why those with endometriosis have a higher likelihood of all autoimmune diseases. A Hashimoto's is the one I see most, but they can have all autoimmune diseases. Um, and I, and I, I, I do think it's because of the role of the dysbiosis in the gut from the longstanding undiagnosed inflammation, I think. And um, there's a whole nother thing as well where there's a increase in like histamine and then histamine all over. And there's a lot of like mast cell activation these days and chronic inflammatory response. I, I don't wanna get too far like into a whole, like we could talk about a whole bunch of other things, but I do believe it's the inflammatory effect of endometriosis. And I, there's just such a higher prevalence of autoimmunity these days. And I think that's largely because of the foods that people are eating, the glyphosates, the stuff that people are spraying on food. You know, it used to be you would get ice cream and it would have like four ingredients. Now you look at a tub of ice cream, there's like 25 ingredients. And why is red dye and blue dye and all these things that are horrible in all our foods? And so there's like inflammation that we keep weighing down our detoxification cascades with all of this stuff in the environment and chemicals and heavy metals and all these things. And it just, there becomes a push and pull and a tipping point. And then the delayed diagnosis, at least for my disease. And then by the time someone comes to see me, I have to unravel like 10, 20, 30 years of stuff in order to get them better. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That ingredient list is a, is a big one. Yeah. Big one. Um, anybody else with, with, uh, questions or a share? Well, Dr. Iris, thank you so much for being with us and spending some time to share about your journey, about all the work that you're doing and, um, about your films and please keep us in, you know, posted on what's to come and when, what can we look forward to? And actually, if you'd like to, you can drop into the chat if you want where people can find these sure. films. Cause I think it'd be really wonderful for us. I know I'm ready to go watch these and um, learn more. Will do. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you so much for everything. Yeah. And before we hang up, I just wanted to jump back in. Thank you. And congratulations, Dr. Iris. Um, you're doing amazing work and it's such important work. And thank you to all of our nominees who are here tonight. I'm looking at Dr. Beth Garner, who has been doing incredible work around women's health in so many capacities. It was um, Carolee Lee, um, Ndidi Unweli. Um, unfortunately, Ndidi had to, um, had to hop off as well as um, we did not hear, we expected Zarifa Ghaffari to come, so something must have happened. So I'm sorry for that. Um, but I think this has been a fantastic conversation because under the uh, under the sisterhood has been really focused on getting under the hood of women's health. So really understanding this disease, this condition, 
you know, one of the things I'm looking at Becky and Sharon and, and Amy, we've been, and Matt and we've been, and Lucia, we've been talking a lot about how can we through story sharing help change the trajectory of diagnosis and treatment. And that's by getting women into the office sooner by getting their, you know, getting their daughters into the office sooner, having them know to your, to your point, um, Iris of really speaking about the fact that endometriosis is a, a household name now really understanding what it means. And I'll tell you, that's the first time I heard that it's a genetic, you know, so I learned so much tonight in, in this conversation. So thank you so much. Um, and I just want to say congratulations to all the sisters, um, all the sisters and all the sisters of the year. 